Obama has ordered the Pentagon to preserve the lessons of counterinsurgency and stability operations in case they are needed in the future. But Kaplan reports that the President has also ordered that minimal manpower or material go toward preparing for resource-draining exercises in counterinsurgency and nation-building. The counterinsurgency cult was more than a fad, Kaplan establishes, but it was much less than a revolution, close quote. And that's from Thana Thanasis Kambanis. I apologize for the, for the misreading of her name. Uh, January 24th, 2013. So please welcome Fred Kaplan. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, I'll stand. In fact, maybe I'll, could I take this out well, now? Yes. So, I will, uh, having established authorial presence, I'm going to take off my jacket. Now. It's very, very hot. Yeah. So, I. So, I'll talk fast enough to uh, finish up before it starts to rain again, but slow enough so that more people might come before, uh, before I'm done. <laughs> so the name of this book, the subtitle is David Petraeus and the Plot to Change the American Way of War. I write a column in Slate called War Stories. <clears throat> but I, I'm really not very interested in writing about war. The book is not about war in the sense of, you know, you won't find big set pieces, battles, you know, maps with squares and X's and arrows where this division went and where that battalion went. Because what, what I'm really interested in <clears throat> is ideas and how these ideas came about and uh, who invented the ideas because they don't just drop out of nowhere. They don't come out of natural logic. And then how these ideas get translated into policy and how this happens. And I talk about the plot to change the American way of war because I, I'm generally not a conspiracy theorist, but these things tend to be plots. They are dedicated attempts by small groups of people to finagle their ideas into power at the resistance of established ideas. And I'm interested in how that happens. And I'm interested in how this intersects with war because of all the political activities of mankind, war is, is the most crucial and the most horrible. It's, it's literally a matter of life and death and not millions of dollars but billions and even trillions of dollars. So these stories about, about these, these small group of men and women, and in this case it is men and women, and their ideas and how they get translated into actual things is that it has real consequence uh, in terms of thousands of lives and the balance of power in vital regions of the globe. So that's what makes it, to me, more interesting than, you know, a, a story of, about how a certain idea might have triumphed in the English department at Harvard or something like that, which, which might fundamentally be the same kind of story, just that the consequences, this is with consequences. So this story actually begins, it's mainly has the Iraq and Afghanistan war as the backdrop, but it begins actually with the Gulf War of 1990 to 91. You might recall Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait. We amass this enormous force to push it back into, back into Iraq and to, uh, try to throw Saddam Hussein out of power, which didn't quite work, but it worked to begin it. And it starts with a, with a young first lieutenant named John Noggle, who later became a protege of Petraeus. He's three years out of West Point, one of the top students at West Point, and he's gone into the Armored Corps, you know, tanks, because at the time, the Cold War was still on when he was at West Point, the big war that the Army was preparing for was the titanic conflict between the Soviet Union and the United States, the Warsaw Pact and NATO on the plains of Germany. He even studied German at West Point, became fluent in the language, he figured that's where his career in the army would be. So he's taking part in this battle in Iraq. And as you might recall, we bombed the Iraqi army for about a month and then overpowered them on the ground in four days. And it was pretty astonishing at the time. And so John Nagel is sitting there, and it's 
just a few days shy of his 25th birthday, and he sees his future disappear because what he's seeing is that the United States Army has just demolished the world's fourth largest tank army in four days. A few months earlier, the Soviet Union has, has imploded. The Cold War is over. The, the great divide between East and West Germany is mending. It's reunifying. And so he's wondering what he's going to do the rest of his life and what the army is going to do the rest of its life. And so he goes off to Oxford to get a degree, partly to find out what happened, what will go on. And one thing that he's becoming aware of is that some of his colleagues at West Point have been out there fighting different kinds of wars. They've been fighting in El Salvador, or Somalia, or Bosnia, or Haiti. At the time, the U.S. Army defined war, defined war as major combat operations, tank on tank, Soviet Union on, you know, United States, conflicts of, of survival. They defined, they, they labeled all other kinds of conflict, such as these conflicts that Nagel's friends were fighting, as military operations other than war. Other than war, they weren't even war. They even made an acronym of this, M-O-O-T-W, and they called it rather disparagingly Moot Law. And the Army General, who was the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the time, was once overheard muttering, real men don't do Moot Law. And yet Nagel's friends, who seemed to be real men as far as he was concerned, were fighting these kinds of wars. And so he figured, well, this kind of war might be what we will be facing. And he wrote a book, and the book was called Eating, Learning to Eat Soup with a Knife. Because the phrase came out of Lawrence Arabia, who described fighting insurgencies as eating, it's like eating soup with a knife. It's yeah. slow, it's sloppy, it's messy, it takes a long time. But Nagel figured we had to learn how to do this. And so he did a study, he did a study of comparing how the British fought the insurgents in Malaya in the 1950s and won, and how the United States fought insurgents in Vietnam in the 60s and lost. What was the difference between the two kinds, between the two armies? And he realized that in part it was organization. The British knew that they were fighting an insurgency and developed a doctrine for fighting a war against insurgents. The Americans who had this mutwa idea, thought they were fighting a replay of the Korean War or World War II, and treated it as no different from a, from a war against those foes, and so lost. They were fighting the wrong kind of war. Now, meanwhile, there are a lot of meanwhiles in this book. David Petraeus, who had graduated in 1974 from West Point, an infantry soldier, he liked jumping out of airplanes and leading men on the ground. He's in France. With a, with a parachute unit, doing some training. And he suddenly becomes aware of a whole body of literature that the French army is very well read in, and he hadn't read in all, about counterinsurgency literature. Because the French had fought a lot of counterinsurgencies. And he read several of these books, and they taught him ideas that he'd never heard of in West Point or any other place that he had fought. For example, or gone to school. Uh, for example, the idea that these kinds of wars are 80% political, only 20% military. You had to fight for hearts and minds, not just against arms. That sometimes in these kinds of wars, a mimeograph machine was as important as a machine gun. Uh, concrete was as important as mortar shells. And he said, well, this is very interesting ideas. A few years later, he finds himself as the special assistant to the commander of Southern Command in, uh, in Panama. And, there's, and this is in the mid-80s. There's civil wars going on in El Salvador, in Nicaragua, in Colombia, in Peru. And he sees, this is the kind of war that I was reading about in my books. And it's clear that the Army has no understanding of or interest in how to fight these kinds of wars. And yet, this is the kind of war we might have to be faced with. So you have these strands coming up. It's a gen the story is really one about generation. 
the old guard kind of came up through the Cold War and sees war as one thing, which involves, you know, killing the enemy. And this new kind of soldier coming up in more ambiguous kinds of conflicts, seeing that, well, no, you also have to deal with the politics on the ground. You have to know what the war is about. You have to deal with social reform. So I'm going to skip many years now, many chapters, flip, flipping pages, because I don't want to tell you the whole story here, and we're not going to be here for that long either. So many years later, uh, let's just pick a time, the Iraq War is about to begin. The Iraq War actually has begun. And you might recall, you know, very quickly, the armies dash up through the desert, overthrow Saddam Hussein with amazing speed, and then instantly find themselves in an insurgency. Uh, find themselves in a civil war, which nobody who had gotten us into this war even knew the basis of, had no idea that something like this would happen, had never even stopped to think about it. And most of the generals who are fighting this war have no idea what to do. All of a sudden there's violence all around them. So what do they do? Their education is to kill the enemy. So they bash down doors, arrest every milita army, military aged male, and thereby start to piss off a lot of people in Iraq and inflame the insurgency. Now one of the people who sees otherwise is David Petraeus. David Petraeus has meanwhile moved up. He is now the, he's a two-star general. He's the commander of the 101st Airborne Division, which finds itself after the war is over, quote unquote over, as occupying northern Iraq in Mosul. And he sees this is a perfect time to apply what I learned all those years ago about counterinsurgency. So the government is destroyed. There is no Iraqi government anymore. There is no Mosul government. His commanders back in Baghdad have no idea what to do. He's out on his own. So he says, okay, men, we're going to do nation building, which was a, 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 a cuss word in army circles. He basically finds new leaders. He sets up local elections. He starts uh, gas stations going again. He opens up the university. He reopens community. He opens up the border to Syria in northern Iraq. He's doing this all on his own. All on his own. And it, it kind of works. It works. Things are really going quite well. Nine months later, everybody is pulled out. A new crew comes in. People who had no idea what he was doing, the place falls apart. He goes back to, he's sent out to Leavenworth, Kansas. He's going to be commander of the Combined Arms Center. A lot of people in the army hated David Petraeus. They don't like people who stand out. They don't like people who are too bookish. And Petraeus was both. He liked talking to reporters. Most army generals didn't. He was kind of an intellectual. They didn't like that. They thought that they were sending this guy out to pasture. Good riddance, David Petraeus. But he gets out there and he realizes, wait a minute, this is the center of things. Out here in Fort Leavenworth, they write doctrine. They write the field manuals. They have the colleges. They educate the people going back out in the field. He sees this could be the center of a revolution. Okay, meanwhile, another meanwhile, back in Washington, there's a guy, some of you may have heard of him, named Elliot Cohen. He's a professor at the School for Advanced International Studies. Kind of a hawk. He was one of the neocons who wrote petitions to President Clinton saying that we needed to invade Iraq and overthrow Saddam Hussein by force. He's also a member of the advisory board, an outside advisory board of the Pentagon. He's the only guy on this board who actually goes to Iraq to see what's going on, and he sees that it's a mess. There's an insurgency, and nobody understands it, except a couple guys, things like Petraeus. Every summer, he does a, a group in Vermont, at Basin Harbor, beautiful lakeside area, getting some academics, national security academics, to talk about, you know, better ways to teach national security. This year he realizes he has to do something different. He has to help save the war. His son, who like him went to Harvard, has joined the army. He's about to go to Iraq. Cohen is feeling guilty. You know, he advised this government. He urged them to get into the war and now it's a mess. So he feels he has to do something about it. He goes through his Rolodex, he finds 
the names of anybody who had ever written anything remotely interesting about the subject of counterinsurgency. And it's about 30 people, and he calls them all together to this conference to talk about things. So they, they're there for five days. And what's interesting, what's pivotal about this meeting isn't so much what they talk about, it's that it takes place at all. Most of these people have never met one another before. They don't know that, they've not known that they even, the other people even exist. They realize that they form a kind of community that thinks alike. These are people mainly junior officers, mid-level officials, some think tank people. And so they go back to Washington after this, full of piss and vinegar how they've got to change things. Now in the meantime, Petraeus out in, in uh, Leavenworth, he actually knows a lot of these people because Petraeus is Mr. Network. He is a guy who has built networks his entire career. He, see, he knows most of these guys. He realizes a, a nascent community. This, these are going to be his ground. These are going to be his shock troops in the revolution. And he calls them together to Leavenworth to help him write a new field manual on counterinsurgency. The army hasn't had a field manual on counterinsurgency for 25 years. Nobody knows what to do. It's a long story how this happens. It's written. Then he has to plot some more because there are some generals who want to send him back to Iraq, but there are others who don't. He has to connive the, the way to get him back. And I won't go through all the details, but essentially he reaches out. He forms a back channel to a special assistant uh, in, the Pen in the White House, a woman named uh, Megan O'Sullivan, who is not like the other woman that we know about. It's, this is strictly professional. And he kind of uses her as a back channel. Uh, the mainstream army wants, they want to pull out of Iraq, and they certainly don't want to have a surge, and they don't want to change strategy. He feeds her arguments. Now this is almost, you know, people knew that this was going on. He could have been drummed out of the service. Here's a three-star general in Leavenworth conspiring with an aide in the White House about how to about how to form debating points against the four-star generals in the army who are trying to do so, who are trying to block what he wants to do. Anyway, I won't go through all the conspiracies. If you want to know more, we can talk about that in the question mark. But by the time, by the end of 2006, four things happen. One, Rumsfeld is fired because of the elections mainly. Two, uh, Petraeus is going to be the new commander going back to Iraq. Three, Bush.